part of it. Today on Lockdown Red Wings, despite Olimata's best efforts, the Red Wings see their six-game win streak snapped by the Islanders. Your Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Lockdown Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I'm a podcast producer for the Daily J, a WWJ News Radio podcast. Well, Scotty's host over at Locked On Tigers, as well as a freelance journalist for the Detroit News. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your team wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash Lockdown to get started. Scotty, uh, well, hey, first of all, happy Friday. But second of all, good times had to come to an end eventually, right? You can't win every single game from here on out. Yeah, yeah. You can't win out, unfortunately. Tough uh, tough league. And um, I don't know. I, just, I had a weird feeling about this game. I don't know. I don't think it's a weird feeling. I mean, we talked about it a little bit last night, right? This is – and you know what? Because I'm getting right into it, I'll I'll go first, difference maker wise. Yeah. This is the style of hockey that the Islanders play. And the Red Wings, yeah, they scored three goals, but both teams had sub 30 shots, which is pretty uncommon in today's NHL. The Islanders play a style of hockey that stifles offense. They push everything to the outside, to the edges. And if you watch the game all uh, the entire game, the throughout it. The Islanders did a fantastic job of even when the Red Wings had consistent pressure, they were cycling in the zone. Red Wings struggled to get it towards the middle for a high quality chance. According to natural, natural stat trick throughout the whole game, Ilya Sorkin only faced two high danger shots the entire game. And that's why the Islanders are my difference maker. And I mean that as in like the style of hockey they play, because what they do is suppress chances. And we talked about it in yesterday's episode so well your defensive style that suppresses chances is the difference maker because the Red Wings already play a low volume style of game when it comes to shots that focuses on shot quality rather than shot attempts. You know, they want to make sure the shots they take are premier shots and that is exacerbated against a team like the Islanders. We're going to give you even fewer opportunities to score. And while they did end up burying three, it felt like all game long you were just lucky to get one on net and get one in the back of the net. So for me, that's my difference maker. It's just that style. It's the most boring style in the NHL, them and Carolina. They both play that way where they just suppress the ever living hell out of shots. It's it's a snooze fest, but that's a really big problem for teams like Detroit that don't take a lot of shots to begin with. So that's my difference maker. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great point. And we were talking off air uh, before, and you had mentioned, you know, the Red Wings struggles against those two teams specifically, right? Carolina and, and the Islanders. So, yeah, you know, it's uh, you're spot on, though. I mean, when you already have a team that doesn't shoot the puck very often, the, the Wings are rather selective with their shots. Um, and I give, you know, I, I'm not a big, uh, like, we don't need to take moral victories here, right? Like, we're in, a, we're in the playoff hunt. We're trying to trying to win hockey games at the end of the day. But, uh, you know, after a, a W6, I think it's probably it's probably fair to, you know, I, I just I was glad that they hung around and that they kept fighting their way back into it. I um, I think the one point you made there was really how I felt the entire game, and that was that every time the Wings scored, I legitimately did feel lucky. Like, I was like, wow, <laughs> That was, <laughs> haven't seen too much of that, and especially with just the the cadence of the game and the way that it flowed too. You know, the, the Wings got absolutely outplayed in the first period, and they picked it up a lot in the second and third. And that's obviously, you know, it was tied at one point there in the second. But um, just because of the way the game flowed, and because of that, you know, going from uh, just getting completely outmatched there early. But then trying to like claw your way back into it. And we all know that the wings are a very good comeback and a very good third period hockey team. But um, yeah, tied I, the game up twice in the third period. 
Yeah, it, it just it was one of those games where I, I I think you really summarized it there well. Like I I did every time we scored, I was like, well, that might be the last one, <laughs> just based on how the game has gone so far. So yeah, that's that's kind of a a new thing that they're gonna have to figure out how to overcome because um, anytime there's like a clear game plan to like you know, suppress goals or stifle your team. That's, you know, you want to be able to overcome that and, and fix that. So um, we'll see going forward. Mine's only Mata. I think that's kind of a layup. I uh, had two goals in this one. His first multi-goal game since, was it March 1st, 2018? So, so if not for the leap day, it would have been six years to the day. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, he had a... Uh, a couple of goals in this one was on hat trick watch there <laughs> for a little bit. He tried to do some dangles in the corner at one point too. lost the puck. He, you know, when you're hot, you're hot, baby. When you're feeling it, you're feeling it. You got to let it rip, grip it, rip it. So, um, yeah, I, you know, and, and we were, like, that was another thing we were talking about, you know, during the game. And then uh, before we hit record was uh, the, the ghost and Mata pair was fantastic offensively in this game. Um, and really struggled defensively. So kind of a, a double-edged sword, not one that we don't expect and one that we're relatively used to, I would say, at this point, and we kind of understand. But um, yeah, Ghost had one of the best offensive possessions I've seen in, in a while. I mean, just consistently keeping the puck in, uh, obviously the, the fake slap shot and then pass to Mata, that entire possession, Ghost is the MVP of that entire sequence for like a minute and a half straight. He was absolutely phenomenal there. Um, but obviously, both of them had uh, had their shortcomings defensively as well. So just um, difference maker, I think you said before we hit record, difference maker in uh, in a couple di- on both sides, difference maker positively and negatively probably. Yeah, I First of all, that feed to Olimata for the, his second goal of the game was absolutely nasty. Mm-hmm. Just disgusting feed. Like, Olimata could have just, he could have. Dude, the net was <laughs> wide open and he still waited. He, like, I was like, dude, shoot. He could have just breathed on it and he still would have yeah. made it because it just, it was so wide open. It was such a sick feed by Goss Despair. But yeah, you're right. We had talked about it before the show and they were on my radar for difference maker two for both good and bad reasons. Obviously, if not for only modest two goals, it would have been a blowout, but at the same time they were consistently and constantly trapped in their own end uh, to the point where they were trapped in their own end so long that that's what caused Christian Fisher to draw that hook. And yes, guys, Christian Fisher's penalty was a hook. It was what he hooked them. Uh, was it ticky tacky? Yeah, it was a little ticky tacky. And did they let other things go later in the third period that infuriated me? Yes. And we'll talk about the refing. Uh, in segment two, uh, but I want to focus on Olimata and Gossis Bear right now. Uh, so Shane Gossis Bear was second worst on the team in relative Corsi four percentage. He had a negative 13.91 shot attempts share when he was on the ice. The Red Wings had 13.91% less. Um, and Olimata was fourth the fewest on the team as well. So they were actively getting more shot attempts against than four when they're on the ice versus when they are on the bench versus their teammates. And it's, I mean, we talk about it, right? Like Olimata is c- consistently pretty sound defensively, but Shane Gosses bear is not, I'm not trying to make this into Shane Gosses bear hate because he, I, and again, in the offensive zone, they both had a really good game in this one, but that's what led to Christian Fisher taking that penalty. Brock Nelson's power play goal. Uh, it's all just, they couldn't get out of their own zone. So it was a weird dichotomy where in the offensive zone, you have Olimata trying to dangle people. And then in the defensive zone, you have them not winning the race to the puck in the corner and unable to get the puck out without just icing it. So it was it there was were different things in a couple ways. He, he thought he was he thought he was wearing eighty eight there for a second. Yeah. Let's just put it that way. He really thought he was. He thought his jersey uh, went up went up a few numbers uh, to say the least. Yeah, mm-hmm. David, who? <laughs> who? Who's that? So yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a mixed bag of the of, of a game. Honestly, it was a seesaw battle. And we'll get into this, obviously, as we talk about it more in segment two. But I, I'm not blaming the patches, which, again, we'll talk about. I'm not going to blame the refs, even though it was questionable, because ultimately it falls on the team to come out and perform. And they were just not the better team in this hockey game in, at the end of the day. I didn't think they played horribly, because what it comes down to is, Scotty, I think that this is a game they came off of a game against Washington where everything came super easily to them. And you could tell in the first period, 
they came out and they were trying to make those same plays. And the Islanders are not the Capitals. They're way more defensively competent than that. And so all those easy passes they were making for offense weren't there. And so it took them until the second period to adjust and actually play like a hockey team. So I think that was a factor. And again, I just think the Islanders style of play is a bad matchup for the Red Wings style of play because again, just to finish off the segment, I'll suppress shot. Red Wings already don't take a lot of shots. So it's a bad, bad matchup. Uh, we'll talk about notable players, performances, and of course, jersey patches and more in segments two and three of Lockdown Red Wings. So please stay tuned for that. Got to talk to you guys today about FanDuel. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any five with any winning $5 bet. That's 150 bucks if your first bet wins. Bet on all your favorite NBA teams and NBA players with quick bets, live same-game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Just visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and shoot your shot. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. Segment two, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. Scott, are you just trying any gestures now, hoping that uh, some no, kind of... shoot your shot. So I know, I know. You did like a shot thing. Are you hoping like a basketball would come out of the background this time? Dude, that'd be sweet. <laughs> we, we, ex we discovered a new one in the... Uh, was it the thumbs up? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Boom. Boom. I'm on a roll. I can't get it to go for me. I don't know what it is, yeah, but... Yeah, you suck. I, uh, I, I, also the, I think the, um... I'm not, we're not just going to sit here and <laughs> try <laughs> random gestures, but I have a um, gesture for you. we, we have two now that we're aware of and that's the <laughs> thumbs up. And then obviously the infamous one. So now the question is, is can we get it to actually work on command? Cause that's, yeah, which question. we can't No, We just keep trying and seeing what happens. That's pretty yeah. much, I it. can't, I've never been able to do it. I don't know what it yeah. is. Yeah. Anyways, uh, segment two, locked on red wings, Scotty notable performances. I got a couple written down. Uh, I think the easy one to lead off with Patrick Kane, 10 seconds into this third period, ties it up. Oh, that Kane. post. You're going to hear that ringing. Mm. It's tough. I mean, I almost made that my difference maker, but I felt it was unfair to give the difference maker to Patrick Kane. Like if he had, if that shot had not gone off the outside of the post, it would have been a tie game yet again, probably going to overtime, at least get one point. Yeah, you can't but, put all of it on one play though. You right. Know? Like, yeah, I agree. Not, not like in the, like last game, you put it all on one play, but it was a dagger of a play. Sure, right? sure, right. Different connotation, yeah. Yeah, in this game, it's just like Patrick Kane had tied it up 10 seconds into the game. Beautiful shot, beautiful fake. Made it look like he was going to pass, which caused Sorkin to be off guard. Uh, Larkin with the assist. And that top line in general, too. I mean, obviously, Patrick Kane, we're focusing on a little bit right here, but that top line in general, if you want to expand it, was great all game. I, I think they've really found a good chemistry with Larkin, Kane, and Dabrinkit that's been electric. And again, I mean... Mm -hmm circling back to that shot off the post. That was a phenomenal job by Debrinket to push past the defender and break towards the net, make Sor Sorkin feel he's going to shoot and then go back door to Kane, who was this close to burying it for a game-tying goal. That line is was the best line in the game, without a doubt, throughout all 60 minutes. But obviously, Patrick Kane scored the goal, so he's the one we're going to talk about the most to get that 10-game point streak. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, ever since that line's been put together, we've kind of been talking about them every game. I feel like that's uh, that's a few now, at least. So, um, yeah, no, they were great in this one. Um, I know we wanted to talk Joe Valeno, hmm. who oh, yeah. was skating really, really well in this game too. Uh, just continues his uh, breakout, big step forward, whatever you want to call it, uh, season. And uh, not that you know he filled the stat sheet necessarily in this game, but I, I think he looks really, really solid. And I think that he's continuing to get more and more responsibility, which I think is a good sign too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he got the secondary assist on Mata's first goal. He actually yeah. failed to reverse it the first time. It was lucky to recover it and then reverse it the second time to Perron behind the net, who then fed, uh, Oli Mata. I don't think the third line actually had that great of a game, but I thought Joe Valeno in particular was really good on that line. Uh, I thought the second line with Lucas Raymond, Lucas Raymond in particular, really drove it. Again, it's just the problem with the, the Islanders show, drove everything to the outside. So while Lucas Raymond and Joe Valeno showed instances of fantastic puck possession and ability to get escape pressure, just nobody was ever able to get to the middle of the zone. But those two in particular really stood out to me as having really good games. 
Uh, and notable, talk about notable performance. How about Ben Sherratt turning the puck over in the slot for the Brock Nelson's first goal of the game? That was rough. And we're a rough couple of games now for, for, for Sherratt. But I'll give him credit for being a warrior, though. He and Fisher both blocked shots, w- went down the tunnel, and ended up coming back. I mean, that's... Dog mentality right there. Christian dog Fisher mentality. is the dog. He if dog of the year at the end of the year. It's uh it's gonna be tough to beat Christian Fisher. He's the he's the FanDuel favorite for Red Wings dog of the year for sure. And it's just um, crazy though, like with how good I felt Raymond and Valeno had played, the fact that neither of them walked away with a shot in this game is oh so, I'm sorry, Raymond had no Raymond, I'm sorry, I'm gonna ask Musin. Raymond and Valeno had zero shots yeah. on this game, like I was originally saying before I thought I was wrong. And uh, it's just jarring because you look at how they played and you're like, these guys were driving the offense on their lines, but it's just credit again to the Islanders defensive style. They did such a good job of suppressing opportunities, man. It's real tough. Um, You want to talk refs, I guess. I mean, I I didn't, I know a lot of people uh, it's very easy to blame refs for games. And uh, I know that I try not to, and I know that you do, the same thing. Like very rarely are we going to come on here and be like, the refs are the reason we lost. And I don't think either of us believe that the refs are the reason we lost this hockey game. Um, I think for both sides, they were just keeping the whistle in the pocket, man. There was a a lot of calls. And that's what I think made what made some of the ticky tacky ones that were called a little more frustrating because there was a lot more not called ticky tacky uh, type of stuff that, um, like I said, was pocketed. So, yeah, just very much, uh, you know, let the kids play type of mentality out there in this one. We'll let the kids play until they call a ticky tacky one. I'm not going to blame the refs either because yeah. I, I'm it was three power plays to two ultimately. So sure. I'm not going to be too upset about it. And this is this is what we talked about the league's worst penalty kill or one of the league's worst penalty kills yeah. and the Red Wings on their two the opportunities. The, the Red Wings couldn't score on either of the two opportunities and the Islanders did score on their third opportunity. I do think the Christian Fisher hooking, well, it was a hook, was a weak call. That's why I call it ticky tacky. It's like, yeah, it's technically a hook, right. but they let they let much worse go. Uh, get a, they let teams get away with much worse. A Ben Sherrod's tripping penalty wasn't even a tripping. Bo Horvat fell on his own. Sherrod just happened to be making contact with him. Like literally, what Horvat tried to do is stop, and his skate went out from under him. His Sherrod stick wasn't even near his feet. So I don't know how Shrock got a tripping call on that. And then the third period, like I can call off the top of my head, there was a tripping against Rasmussen. They didn't call. They hooked and hauled Robbie Fabry down to the ground. Like uh, there, there was another one that, of course, I now Mata. I can't. Yes, yes, hmm. Mata. And so it's just, again, I'm not going to blame the refs because I'm not that stupid. Like obviously the Red Wings have got to, in any single game, you got to battle the other team and you got to battle through the adversity that the refs may or may not put you through. That's just hockey. But it is frustrating when they call ticky tacky ones, and then you see a few blatantly obvious ones that they. The model one was the most frustrating for me because then, fifteen seconds later, is Christian Fisher's penalty. (laughs) Yeah, and I was like, "All right, dude, like we (laughs) just happened, right?" But the Fabry one frustrated me too because he was driving to the net with the puck and he gets pulled down, and it's like. And you can see it every time it happens. The players pop back up and they go like like this with their arms, and they're like. They know it. The fans knew it. So, I mean, it is what it is. You got to win the game regardless. I mean, there are going to be plenty of games where calls go the Red Wings way or the non-calls in this case go the Red Wings way. But uh, it it is frustrating to watch in a close game like this because while it finished 5-3, to the fifth goal being an empty netter, it was a one-goal game the entire third. Yeah. So it was was frustrating. Very frustrating. Frustrating indeed. Um. On that note, we're at the 19-minute mark just about. Let's go to an early break, and then we'll spend segment three talking about Priority, uh, the patch sponsor, the ad jersey ad sponsor, previewing Florida, and uh, roster standings update. So, Because despite the loss, things aren't horrible in Red Wings land. So stay tuned for that in segment three of Lockdown Red Wings. Got to talk to you guys today about game time. They're the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. See the view from your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. All-in prices show your total upfront, so you know you're getting a great deal before you check out. 
buy tickets in seconds with two taps. They're obsessed with finding ways to help you save money on tickets too. Game time has deals on tickets right up to the start of the event. And even an hour after it starts, it's the place to find last minute seats, find exclusive flash deals and sponsored deals on tickets for football basketball, baseball, hockey, and so much more. And with Zone Deals, you pick the section and Game Time picks the seats for big-time savings. And you can get up to 110% of the difference credited to you if you can find tickets in the same section and row for less. They call that the Game Time Guarantee. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Segment three, Locked On Red Wings podcast. Uh, so, yeah, Scotty, Priority is the new Jersey ad sponsor. And, well, I said it on yesterday's show, right? I was like, if they're going to have any company, which we knew they were going to at least have it be a Michigan-based company, and the monkey paw curled. And it's a literal waste management company. Company, A literal garbage company is the sponsor of the Red Wings uniforms. And while I don't believe in omens or anything, I'm never, I'm not going to be one of those people who blames the jersey patch because that's just silly. I like, will. It's on. all the Shut patch's up. fault. It's all the patch's fault. I told him before the episode that if he blamed it on the patches, I was going to remove him from the broadcast. Scotty, no, I, I, I didn't bring you back. I, I you know, doing? I know the listeners stand with me. You're, you're, you get out of here, dude. I know. Get out. Yeah. Not happening. Not happening. When you're ready to behave, I'll let you back in. I can let <laughs> myself in. This is- I miss it. Re- with the other <laughs> hosting platform we had, I could dictate all of that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it sucks. It is. It sucks. At least they incorporated it really nicely into the uniform. They didn't. They, yeah, they did what I had hoped. Yeah. It's red and white on the uniforms. I'm upset that it moved the. Yeah, it the just looks letters. like everyone. I I told my roommate, I was like, if you would have put me in a time machine a couple of years ago when they did this. I would just thought everyone had the A. We were just one of those teams where like everyone's an assistant captain <laughs> or an alternate captain. Like that's just what, uh, that's what it, um, what it kind of looked like out there. Um, so yeah, like they're not, they're noticeable enough. You can see them while you're watching the game. And I, it's not exactly the best optics kind of, you know, just sucks all around. Like we talked about yesterday, but um, I guess could have been worse. I don't know. That's kind of a, a <laughs> like a lame mindset, to, you know, try to convince you like a coping mechanism. Oh, it could have been worse. I mean, I guess, but um, yeah. It's just very – it's it's not a great look that they lost the first game that they – Well, it on it's not lost on me either that they would choose the middle of the longest win streak in yeah. Eisenman's tenure and during a playoff chase to announce a garbage company as their jersey sponsor because if they had done this in the middle of a losing streak slash when the team was really bad – I mean, people would be making fun of it like crazy. Like you're giving just meat on the bones for your opponents to just yeah. make fun of you for this sponsor. Like you're literally sponsored by garbage. Like I mean, what it, it's it's egregious and it's ugly, but it's the world we live in. So, like I said yesterday, apathy's kind of set in, and I'm kind of like, well, at least it doesn't look hideous. Like it's not a super that's small. It's incorporated into the team uniform, like I had hoped. It's like okay. Well, it sucks. It's ugly, but it could be worse. And I hate saying that, but it is what it is, man. It's not the it's not the ads fault the Red Wings lost. Okay, guys, it's just not. That joke got old really fast. Speak for yourself. No, <laughs> I, I agree with you. I agree. Yeah, I know. I know you're just giving me crap. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about the standings? Watch as sure, we yeah, let's do it. Head towards the weekend here. The Detroit Red Wings. Uh, should be thanking the Buffalo Sabres because they beat the Lightning in overtime. So the Lightning only pick up one point on the Detroit Red Wings. Red Wings in the wild card are still first with 72 points. Now two points ahead of the Lightning. Uh, the New Jersey Devils and the Islanders are tied for the first team on the outside looking in, as I like to say. They're 64 points now that the 
Islanders picked up two on the Detroit Red Wings, but that's still eight points behind the Detroit Red Wings. So that's, it sucks you lost that hockey game, but you still have padding left. And that's why I'm not freaking out after one loss after a six game win streak or another reason why I'm not freaking out after one loss on a six game win streak. Yeah, no, this is, this is not the biggest, literally the biggest talking point in the fan base. This game is Owen one in the patch era. Like, like just losing in general. I like, yes, obviously you'd love to win out, but like that, that was never feasible. That obviously was not going to happen. Losing on, on the back end of a, of a W six here is definitely not the worst thing in the world. Um, and that, I guess, transitions us into getting back on the horse this Saturday against uh, Florida. Yeah, and that's going to be a tough game, and it's the final game of your homestand as well uh, because after the game against Florida, you go on a four-game road trip out to the Southwest. You oh, got my gosh, it's on ABC. Yep, national television, guys. Can that's- we ever – I'm serious. Can we ever play Florida on not national TV? This is – Agree. I'm so upset. I'm more upset about this than anything we've talked about this episode. This is ridiculous. Can we please stop? Can we grow up? I am so. This is like three years now of just every time we play the Panthers, it's on ABC, it's on ESPN. It's like, can we stop? Can we please stop? Because they also throttle us on national TV and have for three years now. It's get ready. It's to- ridiculous, man. Get ready to hear Mason Raymond get brought back out again. There you go, Mason Raymond. No, I mean, it is it is what it is, man. I, the last national broadcast against the Blues wasn't horrible. I think the ESPN product's gotten better, and I like the fact that it's nationally televised. And when I mean nationally televised, I mean, like, easily accessible. So, because that's good for the Red Wings to be televised more on national TV. Like, early, last year, when it was nationally televised games, it was on ESPN Plus or Hulu, and that that's just super frustrating if you're a Detroit Red Wings fan because, I mean, yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> it was I harder think. to watch for a lot of people, yeah. and the team wasn't that good. This year, the team's good, better, playing a really good team on national television. That's good for the Detroit Red Wings. For and sure. while it's on ABC, and I, it is weird that they keep playing the Panthers on ABC or ESPN or whatever. I mean, it's a good spot to be in, I guess, if the Detroit Red Wings are looking for a silver lining. A tough team, though, tough matchup, because the 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 the, the Panthers might end up being the best team in the NHL by the end of the season. They like are standings wise, not bad. <laughs> yeah, I would describe them as better than okay. Yeah, they're first in the Atlantic Division, 40, 16, and four. They're battling with the Boston Bruins. Bruins on a little bit of a slide, which is why the Florida Panthers took them over. But they're near the top of the standings in the league as well, and may finish top of the league. Uh, hey, Reinhardt, you want to talk about, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but if, uh, if, if, I mean, if you want to talk about a team that is defensively sound, um, look no further. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> defensively sound, offensively lethal, and has a lot of edge to them. Like they are the complete package yeah. of a hockey team. They're led by Sam Reinhardt, who has 68 points in 59 games. He had reached the 40 goal mark in the game on Thursday night. Matthew Kachuk's got 67 and 58. Carter Verhage has 61 and 59. So the Red Wings have three players in the 50s. The Panthers have three players in the 60s. So a little bit of a difference there. Barkov, 53 games played, 55. I mean, that's four players over a point per game, Scotty. Now, after that, it drops off pretty significantly. Evan Rodriguez, 33 and 59. So they're pretty clearly four players. I mean, even that, that's still more than half a point a game. I mean, that's not a bad, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's just like with I mean, but their goaltending's been good this year too. Bobrovsky's got a nine sixteen. Anthony Stellars has a nine twenty five. It's gonna be a tough game. Now the Red Wings did win the last time these two teams faced each other. The Red Wings are very capable of playing up to their competition. We've seen that multiple times this year, but it's not gonna be easy. Because I mean, I was just lifting, listing off who their scores are, but even like by Corsi four, their top ten. Fenwick, their top ten. Expected goals four percentage, their top ten. Power plays top 10. Everything about the Panthers screams elite hockey team. And the Red Wings, who are trying to join that company in the next few years, are going to have a lot to prove yet again uh, against this team in in a, in a point in the season where every game is must win. Yeah, man, especially in a division. Um, that's always going to be a, a bigger game no matter where 
uh, either team is in the standings. But yeah, I mean, this is a uh, top three team in the league in save percentage, second in the NHL in goals against a game, uh, first in goal differential a game. Um, I mean, what else? Top five power play, top seven penalty kills. So really good at both special teams. Uh, I, the list goes on and on. They are a really, really good all around hockey team. The one, the one area that you can exploit is, uh, they are second to last in the NHL in most PIMS a game. So huh. if there's anything. I mean, that makes sense. They have show edge. up, sh- have the power play be ready, show up and take advantage when uh, take advantage when they give you an extra skater. That's going to be my my key to the game. We haven't done that in a while. There's my key to the game. It's an it's a layup, but that's going to be it. My key to the game is score more than them. Uh, Thank you, Joe Buck. I'm glad <laughs> <laughs> we have a trade in the NHL, buddy, breaking oh. while we record this at 1045 at night. So the Leafs acquire from the Anaheim Ducks right to defense Ilya Labushkinen. Labushkin. Yeah. Uh, the Ducks get a third round pick and retain 50% of Labushkin's contract. And the Canes get a sixth round pick and retain 25% of Labushkin's. I don't understand this trade for the Leafs. Labushkin's not very good anymore, or ever, really. I, I don't, I don't, I know they need a depth at D. But to give up a third, did they give up a third and a six for this guy? I know that's not a ton to give up, I guess, but I mean, a third round pick is pretty hefty for somebody of Labushkin's caliber. I don't know. I'm okay with it, though. It's the least sure. being the least. I don't have the trade in front of me. So, yeah, I, sure. He's going to take my word for it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, everyone's posting. I know we, we've been talking a lot of smack about advanced metrics and everything, but all the player cards, Jay Fresh, just put, he's, a, he's a projected war of 1%, th- projects to be a third pair defenseman. Evolving Hockey has all of his metrics for like, actual and expected are firmly in the negative. And I, they gave up two draft picks for it. I don't, I don't understand. Okay. All right. Good, good for the Leafs. Good for the oh. Leafs. Go go to Locked On Leafs to listen to their breakdown of the Labushkin trade because Locked On Ducks, Locked On Ducks, and Jason Hernandez, I'm sure, has a lot to say uh, about the good old Toronto Maple Leafs acquiring that depth D man from them. That yeah. warms my heart a little bit on a on a gloomy Friday evening, <laughs> Thursday evening, whatever it is. Of course. All right, Scotty, do you have any final thoughts, buddy? <sighs> I don't think so. We ball. We do ball. It was an overall kind of blah kind of day, you know, meh. But heading into the weekend, big game ahead of us. Red Wings still in a playoff spot. It's my turn. Uh, no, you got it. We ball. Same time, same place. It's your team every day. Yeah.